Welcome back! It's the start of Act 3, and Dr. Pippin Carter has been murdered. Now, there's two things that happen here in Act 3. One is that things actually start happening, so we're not just talking to people and walking around anymore. We'll be solving some puzzles and doing things that you would normally expect in an adventure game. So, that's good. On the bad side, this is where the timer really kicks in, and in order to actually see everything, you have to be quite fast. Which, considering my playstyle, especially when I'm recording uh, Let's Play, is kind of a nightmare. Therefore, it may be necessary for me to cheat, but we'll see about that. By cheating, I basically mean that if I run out of time, I will restart from this point, run through it, and then just edit the recording so you won't be able to tell that I did that. I'm just saying that up front because it means that if you are playing the game yourself, following me as a guide of some kind, then if you do everything I do at the speed that I do it at, you may not have enough time. I will, however, make sure that I can show you everything, even if it means cheating. And according to the uh, lady in between acts, we are still doing quite well, although it is kind of impossible to know what uh, the skill is there. Was that the best she could have appraised us, or is there a better option? Actually, I think that is the best one, since I don't think there's anything I missed in that act. Can we talk to... Uh... Nope, they're gone. They're off investigating the murder. Of course, after um, investigating a murder, what you would do is, uh, of after a murder happened, you would of course leave all of your suspects just roaming around this giant museum without anybody checking on them or anything. It's not like one of them is a murderer. Can we go back into the gift shop now? I'm actually not sure. Should have been locked, I think. This door is locked. It has been locked. So let's go explore the museum. See if we can find out more about this murder and who did it. Because it doesn't seem like Detective O'Reilly is going to be doing a particularly great job at that. Um... Last time we were here, we weren't able to go left, were we? Wolf stopped us. So, let's see what's there now. It is the uh, Old Master's Gallery, I believe. This is the Old Master's Gallery. And I'm right. This short, blustery man reminds you vaguely of President Roosevelt. Despite his diminutive frame, his bearing is self-assured and cocky, and his pince-nez only adds to the aura of distinguished snobbery. It's Dr. Carrington. I think we already saw that description, but... Whatever. All of the other guests will just be roaming around the museum, mostly, and um, when we see them, we have the opportunity to talk to them, of course. Good evening, Dr. Carrington. Good evening, Miss Bow. Good evening. I don't think that really changes, but there is new things we can ask about. We can, for instance, ask about our murdered friend. Well, friend, I say that very loosely. Dr. Carter's demise was truly a loss to us all, despite his pushy, overinflated, headline-grabbing ego. At least he completed his work on the Ancient Egypt exhibit before he passed on. Dedicated chap. I'll say that for him. Any idea who might have wanted to kill him? The man had enemies crawling out of the woodwork, Miss Bow. Practically everyone's a suspect, if you ask me. Everyone? Including you? Well, perhaps I should say everyone except myself. 
since I was at the fundraising event when Dr. Carter was taken from us. Terrible thing, really. Yeah, I would expect most of our suspects to have been at the party. It'd really be a good thing to try and figure out who wasn't. Uh, we already asked him about Smith, but we have Ernie Leach now. There's a fellow who gets the job done. You can't help but admire his industriousness, eh what? I guess so. I don't really know him. I think he's like the custodian or something of the museum. We hadn't seen him before. He wasn't at the party, so we haven't had a chance to talk to him. We also have some new things to ask about, such as the Ankh Medallion. We could ask about the dinosaur bone, but I don't think that's going to give much of an interesting response. We have many exciting paleontological specimens here, Miss Bow. Talk to Dr. Miklos if you're interested in learning more. I guess she would be the person to talk to. Uh, nope, I meant... Things! Damn it. How about this medallion? Do you recognize where it came from? Ah, yes. You'll see that symbol throughout our Egyptian exhibit. It seems to be a staple of ancient Egyptian theology and philosophy. Yeah, I knew that part. How about Pippin's notepad? Miss Bow, I'd read for pleasure. I can't imagine Dr. Carter would possibly have written anything personal that I would find the least bit interesting. Except it might relate to his murder, so... Can we ask him about hieroglyphs? Ah, talk to Dr. Miklos about that if you want to know more. She translates hieroglyphs as a hobby. I guess he does not. Anyway, let's look around this room. Got a bunch of paintings. One of the many paintings in Michelangelo's Battle of the Nude series. Okay. Oh, hey, it's... The Countess. You see a short... Yeah, we've, we've seen that. Oh, why does everybody just show up now? <laughs> that is not what I was planning to do right now. He was a rather good-looking fellow, don't you think? Of course, I was at the party when he died, surrounded by witnesses. But I've already told Mr. O'Reilly about all that. I'm sure you did. Doesn't mean that I st don't still want to confirm. How about, do you know anything about Ernie? Well, I do wish they wouldn't let the handyman in during social functions. He's not even dressed properly. Yeah, I think that's not the right thing to worry about after a murder happened. Do you know anything about dinosaur bones? Oh dear, I find bones quite distressing, Miss Bow. I would suggest not talking to Olympia then. Have you seen this medallion? Why isn't that one of those darling little Egyptian thingies? Do you all have to stand there? Apparently they do. Oh, I'm sure there's nothing on that to concern us, Miss Bow. Yeah, I'm not going to take your word for that. I hope I just clicked on uh, Dr. Smith. It's kind of impossible to know for sure. Nope. You dare to mention his name to me? He is the blasphemous temple destroyer and tomb robber who stole the dagger of Amman Ra from Egypt. Did you kill him? Miss Bo, I am shocked that you would ask me such a thing. Amman Ra snuffed out Pippin Carter's life as punishment for his crime, and that's all I have to say on this matter. He does seem a likely suspect, both because of the Ankh and the fact that he had a clear motive. However, that does not necessarily mean that he did. I'm not familiar with this person. Fair enough. Question. It is... 
Don't think you know anything about the bone. Dinosaur bones do not interest me. They are not Egyptian in origin. And nothing that's it not Egyptian interests you at all? That's kind of narrow-minded. However, I definitely want to ask him about this Ankh. Didn't he wear one before? What happened to the pretty gold Ankh you were wearing at the party? I have no idea. I seem to have lost it. Hmm. Very suspicious. How about the notepad? I don't care about the scribblings of that son of a camel. I'm sure whatever he wrote is a lie. I'm sure. Okay, can I now look at the paintings without getting interrupted again? One of the many paintings in Michelangelo's Battle of the Nude series. One of the many... One of the many... All the same description? Art is work by Fra Bobberto Glissoni, painted in 1492, commissioned by Queen Isabella to keep him busy finding a new way to paint instead of discovering the new world so that Christopher Columbus could do it instead. Is that true? I wonder. Two Brothers Drinking in a Tavern by Rick Morgan, Dutch Master, 1444. Rick Morgan? That doesn't sound like a Dutch name. Cart Before the Horse by Suzette Olive in Gudoni, 1481. Um, sure. A typical light-hearted painting by Anonymous Bosch called A Heartwarming Story, depicting dead humans being tormented by skeletons and demons in hell. Very heartwarming. Is that a picture of... David Hasselhoff? What? Portrait of a Young Man by Marciello Fleming, Italian Master, 1550. I guess not. Musings on Cyberspace by John Wentworth, the Flemish Master, painted in 1533. Cyberspace? That word must have meant something very different back then. Can we inspect the paintings more closely? You closely inspect the nudes in Michelangelo's paintings, admiring his studies of the human form. These paintings were completed while he was still learning his trade as the apprentice to a great artist you've probably never heard of. Probably not. It's nice that you don't actually let us see these nudes. I guess this is a family game. You closely... Examining the painting carefully, you notice that some of the strong-smelling paint looks smeared. Smeared and strong-smelling? That this seems uh, wrong for a painting that's old. When you touch the painting, you smear a bit of the paint as if it's still damp. The paint is damp? Not damp, damp, apparently. That's uh, strange. Seems to suggest that this is a forgery. Looks like we may have more than one crime going on in this museum. Lovely. Don't touch the nudes. Okay, I won't. Are any more of these paintings fake? The swirling brush strokes are characteristic of the Morgan School of Painting. The cracking of the paint is characteristic of age. See, that's more... What you'd expect, right? When you touch the painting, you smear a bit of the paint as if it's still damp. Except apparently this one's also fake. Hmm. Although the paint is old and cracking, the spirit of the artist can still be seen in the bold strokes made by the paintbrush. When you touch the painting... Why are they, like, contradicting themselves? It's kind of weird. The oil paint on the canvas is old and cracked but you can still see the characteristic brush strokes of Anonymous Bosch, who painted with human bones instead of brushes. He sounds like quite the character. Also pretty sure he's not real. Unless he's Hieronymus Bosch's little-known brother or something. Feels like a painting... Feels oh, like a painting by Anonymous Bosch, who is known for the distinctive texture of his canvases, among other things. There's also something suspiciously glinting on here. A typical... You can only look at it when it's actually glinting. A typical... A tip... A 
typical. Okay, maybe I just have to magnify it. There's definitely something glinting on this very uh, nice looking painting. An authentic recreation, at least in Bosch's mind, of happy go lucky skeletons tormenting a dead king named Graham. They appear to have stolen a key from the king, which one of them is placing in their treasure barrel. Um, King Graham? Is that you? It feels like a painting by Anonymous Bosch. Now that you've touched it, a little voice in the back of your mind reminds you that the oil from your finger could eventually destroy the old painting. Whoops. Uh, I'm sure no one will mind. There was silence. Can't talk to King Graham. What's this glittering thing, though? Anonymous Bosch was known for the realistic look of his paintings, and this is a fine example. Here, a skeleton is holding a skeleton key over a barrel, which appears almost three-dimensional as it shines in the light. Yeah, that seems very suspicious. This skeleton key is inscribed with eerily articulated markings, the weird orthography of a long dead tongue. It offers no clue as to what it unlocks. Pandora's box, perhaps? Looks like we actually have a real key embedded in this painting. It's an actual skeleton key, glued to the painting as if it's being held by one of the skeletons. That Bosch was a stickler for realism. Apparently so. Jeepers! The shiny key on the painting even feels real. Probably because it is. Although you have a natural attraction to shiny objects, this one is firmly attached to the painting and obviously can't be removed by hand. Indeed, and we don't really have anything that we could use to remove it right now, but it's good to know it's there. It's amazing that you can still smell the slight odor of oil paint on this canvas, as if it were painted only a week ago. Perhaps the previous owners took excellent care of the painting to preserve its delicate beauty. Or it's another fake. When you touch the painting, you smear a bit of the paint as if it's still damp. Indeed. Wonder what's going on with that. At close range, you notice the strong smell of oil paint. Despite the age of the painting, it seems to be in marvelous condition, as if it were painted only yesterday. Yet another fake. When you touch the painting, you smear a bit of the paint as if it's still damp. Also some benches here. A marble bench, provided so that patrons can sit and ponder the amount of culture oozing through the air of this room. The bench is made of highly polished, white Carrera marble. Good to know. A marble bench. Same description. It's one of seeming billions of ballerina sculptures that were made by Degas, who was something of a ballerina fancier. The features of the ballerina are accurate to the tiniest of details. Not really possible to tell. I can't even really tell what it is from this distance. A fine example of neo-quasi Italian Renaissance sculpture by Alberto Ravioli. Sculpted in 1525, the humanoid statue is called, appropriately enough, Ruminations on Death and Dismemberment. Sounds like fun. The humanoid sculpture is not accurate to the tiniest of details. In fact, you aren't even sure what the details are. Alberto Ravioli was still new at sculpting when he created this particular figure. <laughs> I'm sure. A fine example. This is the old... You marvel at the stylish architectural embellishments which festoon the border where the wall meets the ceiling. It's too high to see with the magnifying glass. That's realistic at least. It's too dark up there to see the high vaulted ceiling clearly. I suppose so. 
Well, nothing of interest to murder here, unless the uh, painting forgery has something to do with that, but since Dr. Carter only had anything to do with the Egyptian exhibit, I kind of doubt that. And here we have a room with sculptures in it. You hear muffled voices coming through the door to Yvette's office. And a room with muffled voices. Yvette's office is uh, this door. This is the door to Yvette Delacroix's office. And earlier in the evening, somebody made a joke that we could use the glass to listen at doors. So let's actually do that. Thank you for coming to see me, Olympia. This is very nice of you. You're very welcome, my dear. What can I do for you? Oh, you see, I found this strange bone, and I said to myself, Yvette, if anyone can tell you what this is, it would be Olympia. A bone, you say? How fascinating. Where did you find it? I found it right here in the museum. Here it is, Doctor. Now, let me see. Ha <laughs> If that you silly girl, this is a chicken bone. It is? Yes, of course. For it is still greasy. You got this at dinner, didn't you? <laughs> oh, you have caught me, Olympia. I was playing the little joke on you. You are a funny girl, Livet. But I am quite fond of you. Olympia, we are the good friends, no? I have the problem I wish to talk to you about. Oh, certainly. What is it? Come closer so I can whisper it to you. It is very personal, and I want no one to overhear. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. That's my best George Takei impression. Well, that's suspicious. Too bad we don't actually know what they're talking about. I don't think we can barge in on this them. This door is locked. We cannot. Let's look at the sculptures here. What a handsome fellow. Let's see what the plaque says. Caesar Augustus, BC 63 to AD 14. Octavian, great-nephew and adopted son of Julius Caesar, he assumed the name Augustus after his sound defeat of Mark Antony left him supreme master of the Roman world. He was the first of the true Roman emperors, not counting Julius, who didn't live long enough to enjoy the title, and established the Pax Romana throughout the empire. His wife murdered him with a poisoned fig. He was a pretty nice fellow for an emperor, and everybody missed him. Okay, looks like we've got some Roman emperors over here. It's made of marble. Oh my, he looks dour. Let's see who he is. Tiberius, BC 42 to AD 37. Tiberius disliked most everyone and practiced the strictest economy with funds devoted to public amusement. Consequently, most everyone disliked him. Although he was perceived by the upper classes as a suspicious, ill-natured tyrant throughout his reign, he ruled the empire with a firm, capable hand, and Rome prospered. He was most probably smothered by his nephew Caligula, although no one is quite sure to this day. Nobody missed him. Unlike the previous guy. It's made of pitted marble. I wonder who the next one is. Oh dear, he looks somewhat dissipated. Let's read his plaque. Caligula, BC 37 to AD 41. Caligula started out a decent enough chap, but shortly after he became emperor, he was seized with a severe illness which unsettled his reason. Consequently, his name has become a byword for frantic cruelties and insane imaginings. The grotesque atrocities of his reign were ended 
when he was assassinated by the Praetorian Guard in a grimy tunnel beneath the Colosseum. Nobody missed him, either. Not surprised by that? It's made of fine Corinthian marble. Look at her all made from different marble. There's a thoughtful looking gentleman. What does his plaque say? Claudius, BC 10 to AD 54. Enthroned by the Praetorian Guard after the assassination of his odious nephew Caligula, Claudius accomplished much for the Empire. Although weak and timid by nature, he proved to be a noble statesman. He built the famous Roman aqueducts and conducted a successful campaign against Britain. His fourth wife murdered him with a poisoned mushroom. She didn't miss him, but the rest of the Empire did. I'm glad we got the end of the tale of who missed who in the Roman Empire. A close inspection reveals that this is not real marble. It's an imitation marble invented by Claudius Brutus Apollonius Biggus Blimpus Maximus, known to his friends as Fatus Rotundus. What? Fatus was ahead of his time, since the world was not yet ready for synthetic marble. Fatus also invented radar, but nobody knew what to do with it. Radar technology was then forgotten until World War II, and Fatus never got any credit for it. Fatus Rotundus died in obscurity his genius unrecognized. Um, sure. Let's go with that. This statue in the middle looks kind of familiar. You feel a blush creeping over your face as you look at the perfect body of Rodin's famous thinker. Indeed. What perfect burnishing. You can't imagine how long it must take to create a thing of such beauty. Very long, I'm sure. Uh, we can actually go down here. Let's see where that takes us. It takes us to an office. This is the office of Dr. Olympia Miklos. Which, really, we should have been able to guess, right? And hey, look at that. I can't go to the menu, which means I can't save. I don't know if this is a glitch or what, but this game does that a lot. And it is not something that uh, makes things easier for Let's Players, that's for sure. It only really happens in this part of the game. In the beginning it doesn't really do that, but here it does. Let's look around. The giant lizards are displaying some rather uncivilized behavior. Indeed. You decide not to get that close. Probably a good idea. I guess these are from some exhibit somewhere. Dr. Miklos has many scholarly texts. You see titles such as Common Bone Disorders of Jackals, Parker's Annotated Encyclopedia of Decay, Know Your Fractures, Mummification Techniques, Advanced Dental Identification, and Decomposition from A to Z. Sounds like a fun library. The books are in fine shape, and none of them are dusty. Dr. Miklos must keep current with her reading. Dr. Meekle. That a stuffed animal? It's a rat, ready to pounce. Well, he would pounce if he wasn't stuffed. Indeed. He has blue eyes. You wonder if his eyes were really blue in life. That's a good question. A large stuffed wharf rat. He almost looks alive. How about the snake? It's Barney, Olympia's pet cobra. Oh, lovely. You decide that's probably not such a good idea. Probably not. Not a good idea. Definitely not. 
Yeah, I don't like uh, what this implies. Remember the last time we had a caged cobra in a game? Was that a cobra? I think it was. What an interesting array of books. Some of the titles include Hide Preservation Techniques, The Care and Feeding of Domestic Beetles, How to Raise and Train Rats, Modern Bone Scraping, Know Your Roadkill, and Millipedes as Household Pets. Sure. Dr. Miklo seems to take good care of her books. I am going to deliberately skip over the desk for now. I'll start on this side. It's a rat, ready to pounce. Well, he would pounce if he wasn't stuffed. Same description as the other rat. Cy Pembert, a formerly successful flax farmer from Nebraska, apparently strayed from a museum tour many years ago. His remains were later found in a rarely used storage closet. Since he left no known survivors, the museum president decided to keep him on as a permanent staff member. This office is now his permanent home. Seems likely. The bones are remarkably clean and white. The fully articulated skeleton proudly bears a museum visitor's badge. <laughs> they left that on. That's kind of funny. The cages are empty now. You can only guess at what they once held. But I won't. You see some short, stiff, gray hairs that probably belong to some big, hairy, gray rats. I guess they contained rats, then. There's an array of rare cockroaches in the display case. Cockroaches, how lovely. There must be at least 40 varieties of cockroach in the display. What's on the blackboard? Hieroglyphics! Great. Um, you actually... A number of hieroglyphics are carefully drawn on the blackboard. Indeed. And there's more of them, which you... can only discover if you use the hand. Unfortunately, we can try and translate this with our... Uh, notebook, but we'll quickly discover that we miss half of the alphabet. So, that's kind of annoying. The cloth seems to be covering something up. Another cage, perhaps? No, it is. It's half of the famed Rosetta Stone. The other half of the Rosetta Stone. Well, we know what to do with that. Oh, it's oh, half. Didn't really give you a chance to look at that, did I? More hieroglyphics with um, Roman letters. And indeed, if we look at our notebook, we now have the entire alphabet. And with that information, you will be able to translate these hieroglyphics now. And I will spare you the um, effort of doing that by just giving you the answer. This says, I pay homage to thee, ye lords of eternity. Ra, strong is thy sail in the wind, as the lake of fire in the underworld. Behold Shu, the mother, creating the gods in silence from womb. Quicker than greyhounds and fleeter than light, let not let me not be burnt, let me not be consumed, let me not perish as my mummy lies prostrate in my tomb. Interesting. Not something particularly useful right now, anyway. It seems like. But let's remember for later. It's Dr. Miklos's PhD in Physical Anthropology from the University of Thessalonica, Greece. 
Neat. It looks genuine. Why, it's even made out of sheepskin. What, a sheepskin PhD? It's Dr. Miklos's double master's degree in paleontology and physical anthropology from the University of Thessalonica, Greece. Despite her weird demeanor, she does seem to uh, know her stuff. The degree seems to be authentic. It says Dr. Olympia Miklos, Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society to Protect Misunderstood Inquilines. Thank you, dearest doctor, for helping people to truly appreciate inquilines. You are a true friend of the rat, mouse, pigeon, and cockroach. As someone who's had to deal with rat infestations in this crawl space, I don't like rats. The Society's seal is a little golden cockroach. Of course it is. It's Dr. Miklos's PhD in Paleontology from the University of Thessalonica, Greece. Oh, she has two PhDs? It certainly looks genuine. That's impressive. A magnificent view of the night sky over New York City. I don't... I mean, I got the wand. I don't think I would care to try that again. It's an intercom slave unit. An intercom? Feels like an intercom slave unit. Indeed. A magnified intercom slave unit. Alright then. Since it is a slave unit, there's no buttons on it. It can only work if whoever has the master unit contacts it. Dr. Miklos's desk is large and impressive. It looks like real mahogany. Mahogany. Wow, that's an outdated reference by this point. It's Dr. Miklos's chair. That sounded way more dramatic than it needed to be. Finest quality leather. Even though it looks like a wooden chair from this angle. Luxurious velvet drapes adorn the windows. They look like they would effectively block out any light. I'm sure they would. In which case, I would probably like them. Nice nap on that velvet. What's this? The bottle says, Dr. Moribund's Guaranteed Snake Oil. Um, uh, that name does not match what the... Uh the announcer actually said. The snake oil certainly smells bad. Well, since we've already seen one snake, probably not a bad thing to have. Oh. Hey, it's Dr. Miklos. Can you tell us what the vet told you? Probably not. Good evening, Miss Ball. Oh! You startled me! Good. It gets the blood flowing. Doesn't it? Well, I suppose so. I see you're looking at my snake oil. Well, I was just looking around. I'm sure you meant no harm. What's the snake oil for, anyway? It repels snakes, of course. Comes in handy when I'm working in the basement. I lost a load of Egyptian cobras down there a few weeks ago. And I occasionally come across one of those little darlings. Those snakes always want to bite me, but I'm sure they don't mean anything by it. It's just their way. They get nervous very easily, you know. Normally, I love to watch them kill things. My Barney will kill anything he can sink his teeth into. Charming. Well, I'd like to chat some more. But I've got to rush off and meet that young Steve fellow. He promised to show me his scars. See you later. Okay. Wonder where she's going. Um, 
That's weird. She did something to the statue, and I just heard something move. I wonder what's up with that. But we'll check it out in the next video.